the Republic P-47 Thunderbolt was a World War II-era fighter aircraft produced by the United States between 1941 and 1945. Its primary armament was 8.50 caliber machine guns and in the fighter-bomber ground attack role it could carry 5-inch rockets or a bomb load of 2,500 pounds, 1,103 kilograms. When fully loaded the P-47 weighed up to 8 tons, tons, making it one of the heaviest fighters of the war. The P-47 was designed around the powerful Pratt & Whitney R-2800 double WASP engine which was also used by two U.S. Navy fighters, the Grumman F-6F Hellcat and the Vought F-4U Corsair. The Thunderbolt was effective as a short to medium range escort fighter in high altitude air to air combat and ground attack in both the World War II European and Pacific theaters. The P 47 was one of the main United States Army Air Forces, USAF, fighters of World War II, and served with Allied Air Forces including France, Britain, and Russia. Mexican and Brazilian squadrons fighting alongside the U.S. were equipped with the P 47. The armored cockpit was relatively roomy and comfortable, the bubble canopy introduced on the P-47D in particular offering good visibility. A present-day U.S. ground attack aircraft, the Fairchild Republic A-10 Thunderbolt II, takes its name from the P-47. Development The P-47 Thunderbolt was a design of Georgian immigrant Alexander Kartvili and was to replace the Seversky P-35 that was developed earlier by Russian immigrant Alexander P. de Seversky. Both had fled from their homeland to escape the Bolsheviks. P-43 Lancer XP-47B In 1939, Republic Aviation designed the AP-4 demonstrator powered by a Pratt & Whitney R-1830 radial engine with a belly-mounted turbocharger. While the resulting Republic P-43 Lancer was in limited production, Republic had been working on an improved P-44 rocket with a more powerful engine, as well as on a fighter designated the AP-10. The latter was a lightweight aircraft powered by the Allison V-1710 liquid-cooled V-12 engine and armed with 8.50 in, 12.7 mm, M2 Browning machine guns. The United States Army Air Corps, USAC, backed the project and gave it the designation XP-47. As the war in Europe escalated in spring 1940, Republic and the USAC concluded that the XP-44 and the XP-47 were inferior to the Luftwaffe fighters. Republic unsuccessfully attempted to improve the design, proposing the XP-47A. Kartvili then designed a much larger fighter, which was offered to the USAC in June 1940. The Air Corps ordered a prototype in September, to be designated the XP-47B. The XP-47A, which had little in common with the new design, was abandoned. The XP-47B was of all-metal construction, except for the fabric-covered tail control surfaces, with elliptical wings, with a straight leading edge that was slightly swept back. The air-conditioned cockpit was roomy and the pilot's seat was comfortable like a lounge chair as one pilot later put it. The canopy doors hinged upward. Main and auxiliary self-sealing fuel tanks were placed under the cockpit, giving a total fuel capacity of 305 US gal, 1,155 L. Power came from a Pratt & Whitney R2800 double WASP 2-row 18-cylinder radial engine producing 2,000 HP, 1,500 kilowatts the same engine that would power the prototype Vought XF4U1 fighter to just over 400 miles per hour, 644 kilometers per hour, in October 1940 with the double WASP on the XP-47B turning a four-bladed Curtis electric constant speed propeller of 146 in, 3.7 m, in diameter. The loss of the AP-4 prototype to an engine fire ended Kartvili's experiments with tight-fitting cowlings, so the engine was placed in a broad cowling that opened at the front in a horse collar shaped ellipse. The cowling admitted cooling air for the engine, left and right oil coolers, and the turbo supercharger intercooler system. The engine exhaust gases were rooted into a pair of wastegate equipped pipes that ran along each side of the cockpit to drive the turbo supercharger turbine at the bottom of the fuselage about halfway between cockpit and tail. At full power, the pipes glowed red at their forward ends and the turbine spun at 21,300 rpm. 
The complicated turbo supercharger system with its ductwork gave the XP-47B a deep fuselage, and the wings had to be mounted in a relatively high position. This was problematic since long-legged main landing gear struts were needed to provide ground clearance for the enormous propeller. To reduce the size and weight of the main landing gear struts and so that wing-mounted machine guns could be fitted, each main gear strut was fitted with a mechanism by which it telescoped out 9 in, 23 centimeters, when extended. The XP-47B was very heavy compared with contemporary single-engined fighters, with an empty weight of 9,900 pounds, 4,490 kilograms, or 65% more than the YP-43. Cartvili said, it will be a dinosaur, but it will be a dinosaur with good proportions. The armament was 8.50 caliber, 12.7 mm, light barrel browning in slash M2 machine guns, four in each wing. The guns were staggered to allow feeding from side-by-side -side ammunition boxes, each with a 350 round capacity. All eight guns gave the fighter a combined rate of fire of approximately 100 rounds per second. The XP-47B first flew on May 6, 1941 with Lowry P. Brabham at the controls. Although there were minor problems, such as some cockpit smoke that turned out to be due to an oil drip, the aircraft proved impressive in its first trials. It was eventually lost in an accident on August 8, 1942, but before that mishap, the prototype had achieved a level speed of 412 miles per hour. 663 km per hour, at 25,800 feet, 7,864 m, altitude, and had demonstrated a climb from sea level to 15,000 feet, 4,600 m, altitude in 5 minutes. P-47B, XP-47E, and XP-47F the XP-47B gave the newly reorganized United States Army Air Forces cause for both optimism and apprehension. While possessing good performance and firepower, the XP-47B had its share of teething problems. Its sheer size and limited ground propeller clearance in a fuselage-level attitude made for challenging takeoffs which required long runways the pilot had to hold the tail low until considerable speed was attained on the initial run. The sideways opening canopy covers had a tendency to jam. The multiple gun installation, with its tight fit and cramped ammunition belt tracks, experienced jamming problems, especially during and after hard maneuvering. Maneuverability was less than desired when compared with the Supermarine Spitfire and Messerschmitt Bf 109. The ignition system arced at high altitude. Access to the rear engine accessory pad was difficult due to the short engine mount used. At high altitude the ailerons snatched and froze. At high speeds the control loads were deemed excessive. Republic addressed the problems by fitting a rearward sliding canopy that could be jettisoned in an emergency, a pressurized ignition system, and new all-metal control surfaces. The deficient maintenance access to the double WASP radial on the B-series subtypes had to wait until the P-47C introduced a new engine mount. While the engineers worked frantically to get their dinosaur to fly right, the USAF ordered 171 P-47BS. An engineering prototype P-47B was delivered in December 1941, with the production prototype following in March 1942, and the first production model provided in May. Republic continued to improve the design as P-47BS were produced and although all P-47BS had the sliding canopy and the new General Electric Turbo Supercharger Regulator for the R2800-21 engine, features such as all-metal control surfaces were not standard at first. A modification on the P-47B, also required for the early marks of the U.S. Navy's Grumman F-4F Wildcat and Grumman F-6F Hellcat was the radio mast behind the cockpit that was slanted forward to maintain the originally designed antenna wire length in spite of the new sliding canopy. The P-47B led to a few one-off variants. In September 1942, the 171st and last P-47B, 41-6065, was also used as a test platform under the designation XP-47E to evaluate the R2800-59 engine, a pressurized cockpit with a hinged canopy and, eventually, a new Hamilton standard propeller. 
the plans for production were cancelled after increased emphasis on low-level operations over Europe. Another P-47B was later fitted with a new laminar flow wing in search of higher performance and redesignated XP-47F. In 1942 an example of the potentially 3000 HP Ferry P-24 Monarch engine along with the Ferry Battle Test Bed it was installed and was shipped to Wright Field for testing with a view to possible installation in the P-47. After around 250 hours of test flying of the P-24 engined battle at Wright Field, the idea to re-engine the P-47 with the P-24 was abandoned. P-47C Production changes gradually addressed the problems with P-47B, and on balance, with experience, the USAF decided that the P-47 was worthwhile, and quickly followed the initial order for P-47BS with another order for 602 more examples of an improved model, named P-47C, with the first of this variant delivered in September 1942. The initial P-47CS were very similar to the P-47B. Initial deliveries of the Thunderbolt to the USAF were to the 56th Fighter Group, which was also on Long Island. The 56th served as an operational evaluation unit for the new fighter. Teething problems continued. A Republic test pilot was killed in the 5th production P-47B when it went out of control in a dive on March 26, 1942, and crashed due to failure of the tail assembly, after fabric-covered tail surfaces ballooned and ruptured. The introduction of revised rudder and elevator balance systems and other changes corrected these problems. Essentially similar to the P-47B, the initial P-47C featured strengthened all-metal control surfaces, an upgraded GE turbo supercharger regulator, and a short vertical radio mast. After the initial manufacture of a block of 57 P-47CS, production moved to the P-47C1, which had an 8-in. 20 cm, fuselage extension forward of the cockpit at the firewall to correct center of gravity problems, ease engine maintenance and allow installation of a new engine mount. There were a number of other changes, such as revised exhausts for the oil coolers, and fixes to brakes, undercarriage and electrical systems, as well as a redesigned rudder and elevator balance. The 55 P-47C-1S were followed by 128 P-47C-2S which introduced a centerline hardpoint with under-fuselage shackles for either a 500 pounds, 227 kilograms, bomb or a 200 US gal, 758 liters, 167 imp gal, fuel tank that conformed to the underside of the fuselage. The main production P-47C subvariant was the P-47C-5 which introduced a new whip antenna. With the use of pressurized drop tanks, the P-47C was able to extend its range on missions beginning July 30, 1943. By the end of 1942, most of the troubles with the P-47 had been worked out and P-47CS were sent to England. The 56th FG was sent overseas to join the 8th Air Force whose 4th and 78th fighter groups would be equipped with the Thunderbolt as well. P-47D-P-47G and XP-47K-XP-47L Refinements of the Thunderbolt continued, leading to the P-47D, which was the most produced version with 12,558 built. The D model actually consisted of a series of evolving production blocks, the last of which were visibly different from the first. The first P-47DS were actually the same as P-47CS Republic could not produce Thunderbolts fast enough at its Farmingdale plant on Long Island, so a new plant was built at Evansville, Indiana. The Evansville plant first built a total of 110 P-47D1RAS, which were completely identical to P-47C2S. Farmingdale aircraft were identified by the re-suffix after the block number while Evansville aircraft were given the RA suffix. The P-47D-1 through P-47D-6, the P-47D-10, and the P-47D-11 successively incorporated changes such as the addition of more engine cooling flaps around the back of the cowl to reduce the engine overheating problems that had been seen in the field. Engines and engine subsystems saw refinement, the P-47D-10 introduced the R-2800-63, 
replacing the R2800-21 seen in previous P47S, as did the fuel, oil, and hydraulic systems. Additional armor protection was also added for the pilot. The P47D15 was produced in response to requests by combat units for increased range. Wet, equipped with fuel plumbing, underwing pylons were introduced to allow a bomb or drop tank pressurized by vented exhaust air to be carried under each wing, in addition to the belly tank. Seven different auxiliary tanks were fitted to the Thunderbolt during its career. 200 US gallon, 758 liters, ferry tank, a conformal tub-shaped jettisonable tank made of paper, which barely cleared the ground on grass airfields, was used as an interim measure between July 30 and August 31, 1943. 75 US gallon, 284 liters, drop tank, a standardized, all-metal teardrop-shaped steel tank with a prominent protruding horizontal seam, initially produced for the P-39A Recabra, was adapted to the P-47 beginning August 31, 1943. It was initially carried on the belly shackle, but was used in pairs in 1944 as underwing tanks, and adopted as a standard accessory in the U.S. inventory. 108 U.S. gallon, 409 liters, drop tank, a cylindrical paper tank of British design and manufacture, used as a belly tank beginning in September 1943 and a wing tank in April 1944. 150 U.S. gallon, 568 liters, drop tank, a steel tank first used as a belly tank February 20, 1944, and an underwing tank May 22, 1944. 215 U.S. gallon, 810 liters, drop tank, a wide, Flat steel tank developed by 8 Service Command was first used in February 1945. 165 US gallon, 625 liters, drop tank, this tank, produced by Lockheed, could be used either as a fuel tank or as a napalm container. 110 US gallon, 416 liters, drop tank, this tank was similar in shape to the 75 gallon drop tank. But was larger. It could also be used as a napalm container. The tanks made of plastic impregnated, laminated, paper could not store fuel for an extended period of time, but they worked quite well for the time it took to fly a single mission. These tanks were cheaper, lighter, and were useless to the enemy if recovered after being dropped not only did they break apart, but they did not provide the enemy with any reusable materials that could be scavenged for their own war effort. With the increased fuel capacity, the P-47 was now able to perform escort missions deep into enemy territory. A drawback to their use was that fighters could not land with the tanks in place because of the hazard of rupture and explosion. Fighters recalled from a mission or that did not jettison their paper tanks for some reason were required to drop them into a designated dump area at their respective fields, resulting in substantial losses of aviation fuel. The P-47 D-16, D-20, D-22 and D-23 were similar to the P-47 D-15 with minor improvements in the fuel system, engine subsystems, the P-47 D-20 introduced the R-2800-59 engine, a jettisonable canopy, and a bulletproof windshield. Beginning with the Block 22 aircraft, the original narrow-cord Curtis propeller was replaced by propellers with larger blades the Evansville plant switching to a new Curtis propeller with a diameter of 13 feet, 3.96 m, and the Long Island plant using a Hamilton standard propeller with a diameter of 13 feet 2 in, 4.01 m. With the bigger propellers having barely 6 in, 152 mm, of ground clearance, Thunderbolt pilots had to learn to be careful on takeoffs to keep the tail down until they obtained adequate ground clearance and on landings to flare the aircraft properly. Failure to do so damaged both the propeller and the runway. A modification to the main gear legs was installed to extend the legs via an electric motor, unextending before retraction, to accommodate the larger propeller diameter. Even with two Republic plants rolling out the P-47, the U.S. Army Air Forces still were not getting as many Thunderbolts as they wanted. Consequently, an arrangement was made with Curtis to build the aircraft under license in a plant in Buffalo, New York. 
The Curtis plant experienced serious problems and delays in producing Thunderbolts, and the 354 Curtis-built fighters were relegated to stateside advanced flight training. The Curtis aircraft were all designated P-47G, and ACU suffix was used to distinguish them from other production. The first P-47G was completely identical to the P-47C, the P-47G-1 was identical to the P-47C-1, while the following P-47G-5, P-47G-10 and P-47G-15 sub-variants were comparable to the P-47D-1, P-47D-5 and P-47D-10 respectively. Two P-47G-15S were built with the cockpit extended forward to just before the leading edge of the wing to provide tandem seating, designated TP-47G, essentially to provide a trainer variant. The second crew position was accommodated by substituting a much smaller main fuel tank. The double bolt did not go into production but similar modifications were made in the field to older P-47S, which were then used as squadron hacks, miscellaneous utility aircraft. Bubbletop P-47S All the P-47S produced to this point had a razorback canopy configuration with a tall fuselage spine behind the pilot which resulted in poor visibility to the rear. The British also had this problem with their fighter aircraft, and had devised the bulged Malcolm Hood canopy for the Spitfire as an initial solution. This type of canopy was fitted in the field to many North American P-51 Mustangs, and to a handful of P-47DS. However, the British then came up with a much better solution, devising an all-round vision bubble canopy for the Hawker Typhoon. USAF officials liked the bubble canopy, and quickly adapted it to American fighters, including the P-51 and the Thunderbolt. The first P-47 with a bubble canopy was a modified P-47D-5 completed in the summer of 1943 and redesignated XP-47K. Another older P-47D was modified to provide an internal fuel capacity of 370 US gal, 1,402 liters, and given the designation XP-47L. The bubble canopy and increased fuel capacity were then rolled into production together, resulting in the Block 25 P-47D, rather than a new variant designation. First deliveries of the P-47D-25 to combat groups began in May 1944. It was followed by similar bubble-top variants, including the P-47D-26, D-27, D-28, and D-30. Improvements added in this series included engine refinements and the addition of dive recovery flaps. Cutting down the rear fuselage to accommodate the bubble canopy produced yaw instability, and the P-47D-40 introduced a vertical stabilizer extension in the form of a fin running from the vertical stabilizer to just behind the radio aerial. The fin fillet was often retrofitted in the field to earlier P-47D bubble top variants. The P-47D-40 also featured provisions for 10-0 length launchers for 5-in, 127mm, high-velocity aircraft rockets, HVARs, as well as the new K-14 computing gun sight. This was a license-built copy of the British Ferranti GGS Mark IID computing gyroscopic sight which allowed the pilot to dial in target wingspan and range, and would then move the gun sight reticle to compensate for the required deflection. The bubble top P-47S were nicknamed Super Bolts by combat pilots in the field. XP-47H slash XP-47J Republic made several attempts to further improve the P-47D. Two XP-47HS were converted. They were major reworkings of existing Razorback P-47DS to accommodate a Chrysler 4-2220-11 liquid-cooled 16-cylinder inverted V engine. The plane reached 490 miles per hour in level flight, but, with the end of the war, it never saw production. The XP-47J began as a November 1942 request to Republic for a high-performance version of the Thunderbolt using a lighter airframe and an uprated engine with water injection and fan cooling. Cartvili designed a completely new aircraft fitted with a tight cowled Pratt and Whitney R2800 57 with a war emergency rating of 2,800 HP, 2,090 kilowatts, reduced armament of 60.50 in, 12.7 millimeters, machine guns, a new and lighter wing, 
and many other changes. The only XP-47J was first flown in late November 1943 by Republic test pilot Mike Ritchie. Less than a year later it flew into the aviation history books marking a new milestone for speed. When fitted with a GECH-5 turbo supercharger, the XP-47J achieved a top speed of 505 miles per hour, 440 knots, 813 kilometers per hour, in level flight on August 4, 1944 at 34,500 feet over a course in Farmingdale, New York, piloted by Mike Ritchie. Ritchie's achievement was not exceeded until August 21, 1989, when Lyle Shelton piloted Rare Bear, a highly modified Grumman F8F Bearcat, and set a new official FAI record at 523.586 miles per hour. P47M The P47M was a more conservative attempt to come up with a higher performance, sprint, version of the Thunderbolt, designed to chase V1 flying bombs, done, in part, by reducing armament from 8.50 caliber Colt Browning M2 machine guns to 6. In September 1944, four P-47D-27 re-airframes, 42-27385-27388, were modified into prototype YP-47MS by fitting the R-2800-57 engine and the GECH-5 turbo supercharger, a combination which could produce 2,800 HP, 2,089 kilowatts, at 32,500 feet. 9,900 m, when using wartime emergency power, water injection. Air brakes were added to the wing's lower surfaces to allow braking after a dive onto its prey. The YP-47M had a top speed of 473 miles per hour, 410 knots, 761 km per hour, and it was put into limited production with 133, sufficient for one group, built. However, the type suffered serious teething problems in the field due to the highly tuned engine. Engines were unable to reach operating temperatures and power settings and frequently failed in early flights from a variety of causes, ignition harnesses cracked at high altitudes, severing electrical connections between the magneto and distributor, and carburetor valve diaphragms also failed. Persistent oil tank ruptures in replacement engines were found to be the result of inadequate protection against salt water corrosion during transshipment. In the end, it was simply errors made by the R2800-57 model engines manufacturers which led to these issues with the P47M. By the time the bugs were worked out, the war in Europe was nearly over. However, P47MS still destroyed 15 enemy aircraft in aerial combat. Normal results for any fighter type in March May 1945 when aerial encounters with the Luftwaffe were rare. The entire production total of 130 P 47 MS were delivered to the 56th Fighter Group, and were responsible for all seven of that group's jet shoot downs. Twelve were lost in operational crashes with the 56th Group, resulting in 11 deaths, two after VE Day, and two. 44 to 21,134 on April 13, 1945 and 44 to 21,230 on April 16, 1945, were shot down in combat, both by ground fire. The second YP-47M, of the batch of four converted P-47DS, was later fitted with new wings and served as the prototype for the P-47N. P-47N the P-47N was the last Thunderbolt variant to be produced. It was designed as an escort fighter for the Boeing B-29 Superfortress bombers flying raids on the Japanese home islands. Increased internal fuel capacity and drop tanks had done much to extend the Thunderbolt's range during its evolution, and the only other way to expand the fuel capacity was to put fuel tanks into the wings. Thus, a new wing was designed with 250 US gallon. 190 liters, fuel tanks. The third YP-47M prototype, 42 to 27,387, was fitted with this wing and became the YP-47N, its designation was later changed to XP-47N. This redesigned aircraft first flew in July 1944. The redesign proved successful in extending range to about 2,000 miles, 3,200 kilometers, 
and the squared-off wingtips improved the roll rate. The P-47N entered mass production with the R-2800-57 engine, and later used the upgraded R-2800-73 or minus 77. A total of 1,816 were built. The very last Thunderbolt to be built, a P-47N-25, rolled off the production line in October 1945. At the end of production, a Thunderbolt cost $83,000 in 1945 US dollars. A total of 15,636 Thunderbolts of all types were built. Operational History U.S. Service By the end of 1942, P-47CS were sent to England for combat operations. The initial Thunderbolt Flyers, 56th Fighter Group, was sent overseas to join the 8th Air Force. As the P-47 Thunderbolt worked up to operational status, it gained a nickname, the Jug because its profile was similar to that of a common milk jug of the time. Two fighter groups already stationing in England began introducing the jugs in January 1943, the Spitfire Flying 4th Fighter Group, a unit built around a core of experienced American pilots who had flown in the RAF Eagle squadrons prior to the U.S. entry in the war, and the 78th Fighter Group, formerly flying P-38 Lightnings. Beginning in January 1943, Thunderbolt fighters were sent to the Joint Army Air Force's civilian Millville Airport in Millville, New Jersey in order to train civilian and military pilots. The first P-47 combat mission took place March 10, 1943 when the 4th FG took their aircraft on a fighter sweep over France. The mission was a failure due to radio malfunctions. All P-47s were refitted with British radios, and missions resumed April 8. The first P-47 air combat took place April 15 with Major Don Blakeslee of the 4th FG scoring the Thunderbolt's first air victory, against a Focke-Wulf FW-190. By mid-1943, the Jug was also in service with the 12th Air Force in Italy and against the Japanese in the Pacific, with the 348th Fighter Group flying missions out of Port Moresby, New Guinea. By 1944, the Thunderbolt was in combat with the USAF in all its operational theaters except Alaska. Luftwaffe Ace Heinz Baer said that the P-47 could absorb an astounding amount of lead and had to be handled very carefully. Although the North American P-51 Mustang replaced the P-47 in the long-range escort role in Europe, the Thunderbolt still ended the war with 3,752 air-to-air -air kills claimed in over 746,000 sorties of all types at the cost of 3,499 P-47s to all causes in combat. By the end of the war, the 56th FG was the only 8th Air Force unit still flying the P-47, by preference, instead of the P-51. The unit claimed 677.5 air victories and 311 ground kills, at the cost of 128 aircraft. Lt. Col. Francis S. Gabreski scored 28 victories, Capt. Robert S. Johnson scored 27, with one unconfirmed probable kill leading to some giving his tally as 28, and 56th FG Commanding Officer Col. Hubert Zemka scored 17.75 kills. Despite being the sole remaining P-47 group in the 8th Air Force, the 56th FG remained its top-scoring group in aerial victories throughout the war. With increases in fuel capacity as the type was refined, the range of escort missions over Europe steadily increased until the P-47 was able to accompany bombers in raids all the way into Germany. On the way back from the raids, pilots shot up ground targets of opportunity, and also used belly shackles to carry bombs on short-range missions, which led to the realization that the P-47 could perform a dual function on escort missions as a fighter bomber. Even with its complicated turbo supercharger system, its sturdy airframe and tough radial engine could absorb a lot of damage and still return home. The P-47 gradually became the USAF's best fighter bomber, normally carrying 500 pounds, 227 kilograms, bombs, M8 4.5 in, 115 mm, or 5 in, 127 mm, high-velocity aircraft rockets. HVARs, also known as Holy Moses. From D-Day until VE-Day, 
Thunderbolt pilots claimed to have destroyed 86,000 railroad cars, 9,000 locomotives, 6,000 armored fighting vehicles, and 68,000 trucks. Post-war service With the end of World War II, orders for 5,934 were cancelled. The P-47 continued serving with the U.S. Army Air Forces through 1947, the USAF Strategic Air Command from 1946 through 1947, the active duty United States Air Force until 1949, and with the Air National Guard until 1953, receiving the designation F-47 in 1948. P-47S served as spotters for rescue aircraft such as the OA-10 Catalina and Boeing B-17H. In 1950, P-47 Thunderbolts were used to suppress the Declaration of Independence in Puerto Rico by nationalists during the Jawia Uprising. The P-47 was not deployed to Korea for the Korean War. The North American P-51 Mustang was used by the U.S. Air Force, mainly in the close air support role. Since the Mustang was more vulnerable to being shot down, and many were lost to anti-aircraft fire, some former P-47 pilots suggested the more durable Thunderbolt should have been sent to Korea. However, the P-51D was available in greater numbers in the U.S. Air Force and ANG inventories. Due to continued post-war service with U.S. military and foreign operators, a number of P-47S have survived to the present day, and a few are still flying. The Cuban Air Force took delivery of 29 ex-U.S. Air Force airframes and spares. By the late 1950s the P-47 was considered obsolete but were well suited for coin tasks. Some fought Castro's rebellion. P-47 in Allied, non-U.S. service. P-47S were operated by several Allied air arms during World War II. The RAF received 240 Razorback P-47DS which they designated Thunderbolt Mark I, and 590 Bubbletop P-47D-25S, designated Thunderbolt Mark IIS. With no need for another high-altitude fighter, the RAF adapted their Thunderbolts for ground attack, a task for which the type was well suited. Once the Thunderbolts were cleared for use in 1944, they were used against the Japanese in Burma by 16 RAF squadrons of the Southeast Asia Command from India. Operations with Army Support, operating as cab ranks to be called in when needed, attacks on enemy airfields and lines of communication, and escort sorties. They proved devastating in tandem with Spitfires during the Japanese breakout attempt at the Sitang Bend in the final months of the war. The Thunderbolts were armed with three 500 pounds. 227 kilograms, bombs or, in some cases, British 60 Po. Please subscribe and thanks for watching.